So in this video, we're going to talk about gravity and gravitational acceleration. So what is gravity? We can consider gravity, gravity as a type of fundamental force that attracts objects with mass toward one another. So it is the very nature of having mass that is going to produce gravity. So any object with mass has a gravitational force. Even you have a gravitational force. It's not anything compared to what we experience here on Earth because of Earth's very large mass, but anything with mass has gravity. Now again, we're particularly interested in Earth's gravity because it is the largest mass anywhere close to us. So Earth's gravity pulls objects towards the center of the planet, which is fundamentally responsible for keeping us grounded, which is to say on the ground rather than floating or suspending in air and it controls planetary orbits and has an impact on just about everything. So the strength of gravity depends again on those masses, but also the distance between them. It's the reason why we have very, very large, massive bodies throughout the universe, but for the most part we don't feel them because they are sufficiently far from us. And we can mathematically understand and see this relationship with the following equation. We have that gravitational force, is equal to the constant g, the gravitational constant, times the mass of the planetary body, times the mass of the body on the planet's surface, and that is all divided by the square of the radius, the square of the distance between them. So for example, we have two planets here, which we can call planet 1 and planet 2. Now we are going to assume that the bigger of the two planets, planet 2, is indeed the more massive planet. Now please keep in mind this isn't necessarily the case. From these pictures alone, we couldn't make this determination. But for the purposes of this exercise, we are going to assume that planet 2, the larger of the two planets, is also the more massive. So in this case, because planet 2 has more mass, well, it will have a much larger gravitational pull. Now we can see what the visual representation of this equation looks like on this illustration here. So again, capital M refers to the mass of the planetary body, so we can say Earth in this case, and M is, for example, our mass, or the mass of any object on Earth's surface. Then we have R, which is that distance between them, and it's specifically the distance from the center of the massive body, the center of the planet, to the position of the object on the surface. So again, it is the distance and it is the size, the mass, that is going to affect the gravitational force. So a consequence of the force of gravity is the gravitational acceleration. So this is the amount that an object will be accelerated by the force of gravity, which will vary by massive body to massive body. So for example, here on Earth, we have one fixed gravitational acceleration, which is equal to 9.81 meters per second squared. So this means every second, the speed of a falling object in Earth's gravity will increase by 9.81 meters. So if we are to neglect air resistance, the weight of a body does not change its downward acceleration due to gravity. Now this is perhaps very counterintuitive. We have an example here on the right where we have one smaller weight. So this isn't just smaller in terms of size, it weighs less, it has less mass. And then we have a second weight, which we can call weight B, which is larger and with greater mass. Now intuition might say that, oh, well, this is the heavier and the larger body, so it will fall more quickly to reach the ground first. But that is not the case. Again, if we neglect air resistance, so we're only considering the gravitational force and the gravitational acceleration, well then the weight actually does not play a role. The, the acceleration of a body does not change its downward acceleration due to gravity. And gravitational acceleration is what's responsible for the uniform rate of falling objects and is what governs free falling motion. Now you may have seen a similar experiment to this done in one of your high school classes or perhaps online, with the most famous example being that of some heavy object like a weight or a bowling ball and a feather. Now again, neglecting air resistance, so that experiment I just described is often performed in a vacuum, because if you drop a feather, well, air resistance is going to play a huge role, and it's going to float slowly downwards. But if you remove that air resistance, for example, by performing that example in a vacuum, so with no air, 
well then the two objects will hit the ground at the same time, even if their masses are completely different. So now let's talk about horizontal movements versus the gravitational pull. Well, the takeaway is the following. Horizontal movement and gravity act independently. So gravity is acting downwards. So fundamentally, it does not have a role on horizontal movement. Gravity accelerates objects downward at a constant rate, while horizontal movement continues at a steady speed. So what that means is the gravity will not accelerate or decelerate horizontal movement. It's only affecting movement in the y direction, so up and down. And it is a combination of these motions that creates a curved path, which is what we call projectile motion. So we can take a look at an example. In this case, we're talking about a cannonball firing a cannon. And we have a few different positions fixed. We have position A, so this is shortly after the cannonball has been fired, position B at the top of its trajectory, and then the cannonball continues until it eventually reaches the ground. Well, again, horizontal movement and gravity act independently. So here in this bottom illustration, we can see how the X and Y components of its motion change across its trajectory. So what we can observe is that the X component remains the same at point A as point B, and it will continue to remain the same all the way through its trajectory, again, ignoring air resistance. But the same is not true of the y direction. Initially fired at angled upwards to some extent, well, it will have some larger y component. But as it works against gravity, that y component will decrease until the top of its trajectory where it has no y component. And then as it begins to fall downwards rather than travel upwards, that y component will increase as gravity accelerates the object downwards. But again, the key takeaway is that horizontal movement and gravity act independently. The horizontal component, the horizontal motion, will not be affected only in the vertical. So now let's take a look at a few examples of moderating elements. And by moderating elements, we essentially mean factors that will influence the motion of objects under gravitational force. So one example is friction, which slows motion by opposing gravitational pull, reducing the speed of sliding objects. So for example, here we have some object which is sliding down some sort of a ramp. Now, if it's moving in this direction, down the ramp, fundamentally because of the gravitational force, without it, it would not be sliding down the ramp, this will be opposed by the force of friction which acts in the opposite direction. So again, it is gravity that is seeing this object slide down this ramp, but friction is reducing that speed, reducing that motion. It's opposing the gravitational pull. Now we also have something related, which is inclined planes. And in fact, this ramp could be considered an inclined plane itself. But let's look at a different example and let's ignore friction. So we can look at these two examples. So here in the left portion of this image, we have somebody pulling a string, and the other end of that string is attached to an object, and it's being pulled up this ramp. So it's not sliding down, but instead it's being pulled up. Now, instead of using an inclined plane, the object can be pulled directly. So we have the same situation where we have somebody holding one end of the string, the other end of the string is attached to this object, and this object is being pulled directly upwards against gravity. Now the benefit of using an inclined plane is it increases the distance to reduce the force. So this situation with the inclined plane makes it easier to lift the object. And it's fundamentally because it's distributing gravitational force over that longer distance. So both factors influence how objects move under gravity in real world contexts. We also talked about air resistance. And these are again what we mean by moderating elements. We like to talk about and learn about gravity, ignoring these other factors. But in real world scenarios, there are many factors and parameters that will influence how objects move under gravity. So let's summarize some of the key information that we learned in this lesson. First of all, gravity is a fundamental force, and it is a force that attracts objects with mass toward one another. The strength of the gravitational force depends on the masses involved and the distance between them. 
Then we have this equation to calculate the gravitational force between two massive bodies. And on Earth, the gravitational acceleration is constant, and it's equal to 9.81 meters per second squared. So gravity accelerates objects downward at a constant rate, and that constant rate again is 9.81 meters per second squared on Earth, and horizontal movement continues at a steady speed. So this means again that gravity will not affect horizontal movement. Then we have some moderating elements, and the two that we talked about include friction, which slows motion by opposing gravitational pull, reducing the speed of sliding objects, whereas inclined planes reduce the force needed to lift or move objects by distributing gravitational force over a longer distance.